This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Um, welcome to uh, the uh, final Metropolitan History Seminar for this term, where we have an action-packed programme <laughs> scheduled for, for next term, and the uh, copies of that will come round at some stage from Matthew. Um, I'm delighted today uh, to welcome uh, Colin Tom. Uh, Colin is senior historian with the Survey of London, and I'm sure the Survey of London needs no introduction to uh, people present here today, other than maybe to say that after its distinguished history with the LCC, the GLC, English Heritage, it's now part of UCL as of about a year ago, so I'm delighted now to have uh, uh, Colin and his colleagues as sort of my colleague as well in another part of UCL. Um, uh, they published uh, two wonderful volumes on Battersea about just in a year ago. About the same time as the move, yes. Yeah. The hand at once. Um, and uh, since then they've been working on part of the West End and are just starting to work, I think, on part of the East End. And that, I assume, is why Colin's title today is West End Girls and East End uh, Boys. Uh, we have, as you will have, most of you will have seen, we have some technical difficulties, which means that for the film bit, we may simply have to turn the laptop round and show it to you, because it's working on the laptop, but it's not working on the, on the big screen uh, behind Colin. And also at this point, I have to make the usual statement that we are going to be recording this seminar. And if you don't want your voice to be recorded in any question time, please tell us in advance of asking a question so we can switch the recorder off. But if nobody speaks in that uh, to tell us otherwise, I'll assume that we are just going to keep playing and that all your words, as well as all Colin's words, uh, will uh, appear on the uh, subsequent podcast. Uh, and uh, have you actually switched it on yet, Matthew? Yes. Oh, it is. It's running down. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, West End girls and East End boys, Colin Tom. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, my main purpose over the next 45 or 50 minutes or so is to let you see what the survey is doing at the moment, mostly in its current work on the West End parish of Marlebone. But I'd also like towards the end to show you some of the new work we're hoping to start very shortly um, on a future project in Whitechapel in the East End of London. And also a few examples of different approaches we are trying to take in way, new ways of presenting our findings in our work in London, which I hope will be a good basis for some discussion um, later. And please bear with me with the te technology. Um, I'm presuming you all know of the Survey of London, what it is and what it does, but just in case I thought I'd spend only a few minutes doing a rapid race through its uh, origins and history, and I thought it might help if you see it from somebody from the inside, see the kind of view that we have of it. Um, although the survey, uh, here we go, is that moving? It is good, it's not moving on me, but it's moving here. Although the survey is now known as a, a comprehensive work on urban history, on London's architecture and history. It actually began as a campaigning body. It was founded in the 1890s by the architect, designer and social thinker C.R. Ashby um, as a way of recording and drawing attention to and thereby helping protect from threats of redevelopment and demolition London's historic fabric. This was at a time when there was as yet no statutory protection for historic buildings, no listed buildings, no scheduled ancient monuments. <clears throat> and Ashby was quite an uh, enlightened, progressive thinker um, in this way. He, he thought about the potential loss to ordinary Londoners of the destruction of so much uh, historic buildings. He saw people's historic environment as every much uh, a path to social enlightenment as other um, facilities such as open spaces or libraries or art galleries or museums. Um, so for him it was uh, almost a social crusade 
to bring uh, the, the danger to London's historic fabric to, to, to greater um, light. Eventually, in time, Ashby's volunteer project was taken over by the London County Council, then the Greater London Council, and was professionalised. And now it's very much uh, a work of urban history. That campaigning element that Ashby initiated no longer is relevant. We now have uh, people who protect buildings through listing and scheduling. So it's much more a work of exposition, of explaining how and why London has become what it is. and. The common thread that runs through it is London's historic building fabric. And the map you see shows roughly where we've got to now. I know it's not very clear, but um, that black line is actually the old LCC boundary of London. It's not the Great London boundary, which is far bigger. Um, and in fact, what I want to talk about now is one of the biggest research questions that we have facing us working for the Survey of London is the very question of which areas to cover next. Um, setting a team of historians, even a small one, onto a path to spend several years researching in some detail the history of one part of London is a decision that we don't take particularly lightly. We do have some rough parameters that we try and bear in mind um, as we make this decision. Um, Francis Shepherd who guided the survey for ooh, about a 25 year period, produced 10, 16, I think it is, 16, sorry, volumes in that period, used to argue that its researchers' skills were best put to use in an area where the historic fabric was at its greatest and where the threat of change through redevelopment or demolition uh, was imminent. Um, furthermore, we would argue that our abilities are perhaps better put to use in areas where um, questions such as the layers of development or the land ownership pattern is particularly complex and hard to unravel. Now both of which uh, I think argue towards covering um, parts of inner London. Sorry I'm not moving along. Sorry about this. parts of inner London rather than outer London. Sorry, I've got everything moving on the sc screen, but not... Ah, here we go. Inner London rather than outer London. Because in outer London you get local stories you can do some very good work um, conveying a much sort of simpler pattern of development. There's also an understanding that we should at times take on areas where uh, the research methodology required may be new uh, and therefore would assist others in the future who might be embarking on a similar type of area. And there's also the need to be seen to be relatively even-handed in terms of geographical coverage and not sticking to one part of London for too long, for instance. Uh, and the example I'd like to show is that um, after 25 years spent unravelling the history of parts of Westminster and Kensington, um, the survey in the mid-1980s under its then general editor Hermione Hophouse took the very brave decision to go off to the very far east and to record the Dockland parish of Poplar and the Isle of Dogs which was then in the throes of the intensive redevelopment that brought Canary Wharf into being. Since then we've also covered Clerkenwell, a former centre for light industry now turned into a very trendy and upmarket um, residential and design centre and most recently we've published two um, volumes on industrial riverside parishes in South London, one on Woolwich and two on Battersea. So there was a strong feeling among the survey team itself that perhaps it was time to return to the West End and to address ourselves to historic architecture with a capital A. But as I said earlier, why Marlebone? Why is Marlebone special. Well the richness of its building fabric is one attraction. It's one of the biggest missing gaps in the survey's coverage of Westminster so far. And there's a strong argument that we should focus on areas like that 
uh, because of the incontrovertible importance of Westminster historically to London, as it was in Francis Shepard's day. Also, there's a common perception, and a mistaken one, that these areas are already well known and well understood. But there are many aspects of areas like Marlebon and also Mayfair that have been, well, have not been fully investigated. And in fact, the absence of survey volumes on both Marlebon and Mayfair is noted with regret in the Pevsner Buildings of England series. Some subjects, such as the uh, town planning, no, oh, sorry, I got too far, town planning experiments by the Adam Brothers in Porton Place, and also by John Nash in Regent Street, I would argue are of national, if not international, importance, and they're the very sort of subject that we should be given support and time to study, to try and, and discern what it is that makes these such significant historic assets. There's also another mistaken perception that these areas are actually well protected and under very little threat. But development pressures, economic pressures, are great in the West End. It is, after all, the retail centre, the retail heart of London. And as a result, redevelopment and improvement are um, irresistible. The survey was part of English heritage when the decision to tackle Marlborough was taken. And it did at the time fit into English Heritage's priorities, particularly those of its London caseworkers, whose day-to-day -day work is largely skewed towards dealing with historic fabric in areas such as Westminster. Now, in planning and beginning research on a big area like Marylebone, we're immediately faced with problems of scale and structure. Given that our end product is still, at the moment, the traditional book format. Something I'll return to later, actually. So Marylebone is a very large central London parish. It stretches all the way from uh, Oxford Street at the bottom here to Kilburn, up at the top. Easily as big as Kensington, which the survey team tackled in four volumes over a period of some 13 years. So it would be impossible to deal with it uh, in one go. So we've decided to begin by focusing on the southern area south of Marylebone Road. We are to use Francis Shepard's maxim, the historic building fabric seems to be at its most concentrated. But even that would be too much to tackle um, given our current staffing levels and, uh, and um, budget. So we've decided to split this area into two and to begin by concentrating on the area, sorry, to the east. And that's roughly, I don't know if you can see this red line, it's roughly the area from around about Marylebone High Street as far east as Totten Court Road where it just, just comes to the end there north of Oxford Street and at the centre is the sort of gridded streets of the Howard de Walden estate around Harley Street and we've been very lucky to have been allowed access um, to the Howard de Walden estate archive and working very closely with them and I'll come back to that also shortly and although we've also got plans for other projects in mind in the East End, we do have a commitment that once we finish this area, we'll move further west and tackle the area as far as Edgware Road that includes Manchester Square, Portman Square, largely a lot of it in the Portman Estate. Even so, once we started to tackle this area, we discovered that the quality of the building fabric, <coughs> the importance of its history, makes it very hard to squeeze everything into two books, which we originally intended to do. So we've since decided to hive off Oxford Street at the bottom here and to produce a separate subsequent volume on the whole of Oxford Street, north and south sides, um, as a separate study, which I'll also talk about later. That's quite a radical idea for the survey, um, particularly in the way we're going to do it photographically, but I'll return to that later. Now, when we did Battersea, we arranged the, the study thematically so that there was one volume devoted to the study of Battersea's housing and the other volume devoted to the study of all the other different building types. So we thought this worked rather well in Battersea where there were some overarching themes such as the river, riverside industry, uh, commons, parks, open spaces, railways. Railways is a huge subject in Battersea which 
if they were to be divided up into the topographical bits in which they fell, you would lose sense of the bigger picture. So that's why Battersea was treated rather differently from most survey volumes in a thematic way. However, this wouldn't work particularly well in Marlebin, where the building fabric has a much greater homogeneity. Um, and it's actually quite hard to try and divide the area up into chunks for individual researchers to have responsibility for, particularly around the Howard de Walden State, sorry. Um, where, I mean, there are some big set pieces. Portland Place, for instance, is an obvious one, as is Cavendish Square, and also the High Street. In fact, this is not a map produced by the Survey of London, ironically. It's a Westminster Council map of a conservation area, and they're assessing which areas are of primary importance and secondary importance, but it's interesting that it kind of corresponds, in a way, <coughs> with our structural problems that we're facing. We can do Cavendish Square as an entity, and Portland Place, and the High Street. But particularly problematic is that grid of Howard de Walton estate streets, where you've got a lot of long north-south streets crossed by long east-west streets, and the building fabric within them is rather similar in character in all these places. So it's very hard to divide it into chunks of individual chapters. The nearest we could find as a comparison in the survey's recent work, and I say recent, I mean in the last 50 or 60 years, would be the Grover Estate in Mayfair. And what they did there was they actually just gave an individual chapter to each individual street. And it's possible we may end up doing something rather similar with Marlon. Now let's go back to those West End girls. Um, <laughs> the lady on the right, the rather fearsome figure there is Lady Archer, who lived in Portland Place, was very famous for her age, um, the fact she was very skinny, and her love of makeup, which she applied regularly and very thickly. And in fact, this was the most polite cartoon <laughs> from the sort of uh, turn of the century, early, late 18th, early 19th century, that, about her that I could find. There are some absolutely horrifically um, horrid uh, cartoons, really cruel cartoons about her. If you do a search on Lady Archer in Portland Place, someone's got a whole lot of them. Um, but the point I want to make here is that survey volumes traditionally would provide information on notable residents, both historic ones and more recent ones as well, as part of its assessment of an area's character. Uh, it just so happens that almost every character involved in the perfumio affair at some point lived in a flat in the part of Marlborough we're studying. Even Stephen Ward even had his um, surgery in Weymouth Street, which I'm, I'm dealing with. Um, this kind of data about residents is often embedded in the discursive text about a particular building or on other occasions what we've done is we've separated it out at the end of a section of text you have a list of notable residents sometimes given in a slightly smaller typeface but in South East Marlborough more than any other area we've ever tackled we have an absolutely vast number of notable people who are resident in or associated with that part of Marlborough I mean one way of explaining this graphically is to show you uh, a search on the Oxford DNB for a free text search in Marlborough and that brings up I think it's 58 yeah 58 pages each one is about 20 25 so it's well over a thousand um, people just in the DNB and we would not normally restrict ourselves to the DNB we deal with residents from much further afield than that um, if you look at for instance Portland Place here you get about 180 results. Uh, Harley Street brings up another 250. Now, if we had to try and deal with all these residents and the others who are not in the DNB, it would absolutely overwhelm the books. Um, so what do we do? Um, I mean, it could even be argued that now this kind of information is so freely available online via things like the, the Oxford DNB or um, who's Who, or the History of Parliament, or Bucks Peerage, even historical newspapers, um, even the genealogical websites like Ancestry. Is there a need for the survey then to repeat the same information when we are faced with the restrictions of a, a book format? Um, well, we do believe that we do have to deal with residents, even if it means reducing the numbers that we refer to individually perhaps concentrating more 
on classifying the types of residents that lived in Marylebone uh, and giving a broader sense of the social character, which we do anyway. And there are several aspects of Marylebone's social, commercial and economic character that are of great interest to us. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon us to deal with them properly. For instance, as the medical question, Marylebone had a large number of very, very eminent hospitals from the mid 18th century when development was taking off, um, partly I think because of the salubrious nature of the, the area near to open fields, um, of which the biggest and, and most well known was until very recently the Middlesex Hospital in Mortimer Street, a building that's now been completely demolished except for its jewel of a Victorian chapel designed by John Loughborough Pearson. And of course we have the world famous medical centre that is Harley Street. Now how and why this good class Georgian residential thoroughfare gradually evolved and developed into a home for the top echelons of uh, the medical profession is something we have to investigate and address and explain. Also how its houses were adapted or rebuilt in order to be used for medical use. These are the kind of subjects that we do have to concentrate on. This reputation um, as a medical centre was forged in the mid to late 19th century. Um, it then suffered a bit of a dip after the Second World War, I think partly due to the uh, emergence of the National Health Service, but since then has undergone a resurgence with the growth in the private medical sector. Before the era of the medical men, Harley Street and the top end of Cavendish Square where Harley Street joins it um, had been popular with uh, the well-to-do, with political um, high-moving politicians, high-ranking military men, the clergy and so forth, and also wealthy merchants. And there was one particular type of merchant uh, that settled in these streets in very large numbers and that was those who had made their name and wealth through the East India Company. Now it's of interest to the survey to investigate the origins of this community, this particular settlement of East Indian nabobs as they were known at the time. I mean it's a subject which has already been looked at in some detail in terms of the repatriation of, uh, of wealth from India um, the importation of material goods from India, but mostly in relation to country houses. Nobody's actually looked at the same subject in relation to an inner London suburb like Marlborough. Although there has been a comparable study recently um, to do with the, the West Indian connection um, through compensation payments made to, to inheritors of, of, of uh, plantation owners that was mapped by, I think it was UCL in partnership with another university. But no one's done this for East India Company in central London. Um, a good example, by chance, a man called Francis Shepherd, who was a wine trader and later became one of the first directors of the reborn East India Company in the early 1700s. His father had been a deputy governor of the company and he was also a financial advisor to Robert Harley, whose son Edward was the first person to develop Cavendish Square in Marylebone from the early 1700s. And you find many of Harley's political sympathisers and, uh, and lots of other East India Company types choose to build their houses there. This kind of decoration this is one of the best 18th century painted staircases in the whole of London. So this kind of thing does not come cheaply. Um, another good example is a man called John Pybus who served East India Company in the 1750s and 60s. He'd briefly been the King's ambassador to Sri Lanka. And when he came back to London in the later 1760s, he moved into this house in Harley Street, which is one of the largest houses in Harley Street. Quite unusual having a, a four bay frontage. Most of them tend to be a three bay frontage. And beneath those Victorian window additions is a mid to late 18th century um, Marylebone house. Also, when he got back, he commissioned this rather nice family conversation piece from the fashionable portrait painter Nathaniel Dance. So it seems that by the early 19th century, the Harley Street area had become really well known as the centre of the Anglo-Indian community in London. 
Um, it was very handy for Parliament, so those who were MPs would find the area congenial, or anyone who was aspiring to political influence. Um, and Harley Street especially, so I'm just checking around, became synonymous with these nabobs. And as I'll, I'll quote to you from the Blackwoods Edinburgh Magazine. This is as late as 1841, so we're on the cusp of the medical profession about to come into Harley Street in a big way. But the quote says that Harley Street is the headquarters of the Oriental nabobs. Here the claret is poor stuff, but the Harley Street Madeira has passed into a proverb and nowhere are curries and mulligatawny given an equal style. So that's one aspect of social history in Malibin that we are um, going to touch upon. Now I mentioned that our work in Malibin involved studying in the Howard Walden Estate Archive. We've had the very good fortune to look at a huge wealth of documentation to do with the history and ownership of this historic estate. Uh, the policies that the estate used in terms of estate management, the history of the buildings there, the people who lived in them and built them. For instance, there are estate maps like this one. I'm sorry, it's rather unclear. This is a map um, by a man called John White, made about 1790. And the wonderful thing in terms of students of um, leasing history such as us is that every single lessee is named on the map. So you know who owned the leases at a particular time for every single house on the estate. Equally, there are, particularly for the Victorian and Edwardian period, wonderfully detailed um, lease books and terms books where anyone wanting to take a new lease from the House of Walden Estate, uh, all the material is written down. Um, it's hard for you to read this. This is actually for a house in Portland Place um, that was famous recently because it was owned by uh, Edward Davenport, Fast Eddie Davenport, is currently in Wandsworth Prison, I think. Um, and it's got a spectacular billiard room at the back, built, we thought, possibly Edwardian period. But this is actually um, from 1892. It's to do with the terms of rebuilding the house. And it actually says here somewhere, uh, excuse me, I should know what this is. Here we are. Construct a new billiard room in the backyard. So it's not to interfere with the light of the Johnny premises. So you can date that billiard room specifically because of this document in the estate archive. As well as the estate maps and the rebuilding terms, there are also wonderful plans submitted by developers and architects for new building on the estate. Sorry. <clears throat> now, this wealth of information you think must make our job far easier and it does but it also presents a slight problem because with this enormous amount of information a lot of it new a lot of it unused before there could be a tendency to therefore give extra weight to the buildings on the Howard of Walden Estate such as these in Wimpole Street when we don't have anything like comparable historical information for the areas we're doing that are off the Howard to Walton Street, which is here in Riding House Street. And therefore, one of the difficulties we've got in our research is trying to maintain a balance when there's an awful lot to say about one type of building because just because of the nature of the documentary evidence and there's not very much to say about another one. So that's one thing that we, we often face, but it's become quite um, noticeable in Marylebone that there's a lot of information in Howard to Walton Street, not so much elsewhere. Balance is, I think, all important. I'll go back to this drawing because another benefit of all this information in the Howard de Walden estate is being able to identify for the first time architects, developers, builders of particular buildings because of the documents that they have. This is actually a plan of the early 1930s for a new house in Weymouth Street at the entrance to a mews. And there was uh, a great fashion actually from late Victorian Edwardian times for demolishing the Muse buildings at the back of the big houses that were on those north-south streets and building in their place a small house, a, a miniature dwarf house they often call them, facing the side street. This is one such case. Um, it's actually designed by a man called G. Gray Wernham, 
who you might know was the architect of the Royal Institute of British Architects building in Portland Place, quite an important modernist um, architect. In fact, there's the house there in Weymouth Street. Now, Grey Wonham is the architect, but he has to present his plans to the Howard de Walden State for examination by the Howard de Walden State Surveyors. And at the time, the Howard de Walden State Surveyor was a man named Colonel Blount, is how it's spelled, B-L-O-U-N-T, but I'm convinced it's, it's pronounced Blunt, which is exactly the right name for him, because this is a very difficult man, a, very, a great stickler. The Howard de Walden State is driven by an aspiration to maintain the estate as a very high-class, upper-class residential area. And part of that, in terms of Gunnar Blunt's vision, is therefore to have architecture that somehow complements or maintains the traditional appearance of the estate. They don't want modern architecture uh, in the sense that we think of it. And in fact, I have not seen Warnham's original plans for this house, but I know he sent them because Blunt was very critical of them. He said, I don't like this. I want something much more like the housing adjoining, which is traditional brick Georgian houses. And what you see that Warnham eventually comes up with is a kind of modern interpretation of a traditional Georgian house. Blunt was even more critical. He, he said, I, I want you to put window shutters on the house too. He was determined it had to have shutters. Uh, one of them held out and refused to do this. And there's another modern house uh, on the same street by Sir Giles Gilbert Scott, who Blunt also said, you must put shutters on your facade. Uh, but Scott again held out. But round the corner in Devonshire Street, this is actually a similar house, again on the, on the corner with a muse, um, Street, designed by a really eminent firm of Scottish modernist architects, Sir John, Turner, Sir John Burnett Tate and Lorne. And it's not the kind of design I would have expected from them in this early to mid-30s period. And part of the reason for that is, again, Colonel Blunt is insistent the house has to have a traditional look. You have to have, you can't have a flat roof, um, there must be a mansard roof of some sort. And he, he, he actually gets here, he gets Burnett Tate and Lorne to give in. And, and give him his shutters, which I don't think suit the building at all. And in this example, this is a, sorry, a very fuzzy picture of a block of flats in Beaumont Street called Beaumont Court, early 1900s. Again, a very common thing in the Howard of Walden estate around this period is the appearance of big blocks of neoclassical flats. Part of the reason for that is the big houses like the Adam Houses in Portland Place are no longer supportable. Um, there are no longer the big, big Victorian families with you know hordes of servants using these houses. People want smaller properties. They want maybe one servant at the most. They want the convenience of flats. And so the Howard de Walton State is actually very happy at this period to be able to knock down the big old houses and build flats in their place because that way they can maintain a polite residential character rather than having the big houses converted into different uses. Um, but this is a, a typical story of the way in which design is not the responsibility of one person, which is the point I'm trying to make here, although I haven't quite got to it yet. Um, this site was to have been developed by a Miss Fisher who built a nursing home here uh, slightly earlier, and her architect James Neal prepared plans for her for this. She then dropped out a different developer, a Mr Perry takes over, and his architect takes on Neal's plans and adapts them. But again, Colonel Blunt isn't happy with the street facade and he literally takes over the design of the street facade, either him or his assistant, a man called V. Royal Gould. Blunt definitely designed these details in the centre which are absolutely characteristic of the kind of thing he liked. Formal, heavily ornamental, unsubtle. And so what really comes out of this little discussion about estate policy and the way architecture evolves on the estate in this period is that this element of multi-authorship is now making us question the kind of age-old approach of what I might call attributionism that is often at the heart of architectural history. We architectural historians always want to know, the very first thing we ask is, who's it by? Who's it by? My boss, Andrew Saint, actually gave a lecture recently at a conference in honour of Howard Colvin called The Conundrum of By. And it's this question, who's it by? 
I think the examples I've just shown you from Howard Walden State suggest that maybe it's time for a more sophisticated, uh, more historically accurate way of investigating design and authorship in buildings of that type. I also want to touch on the, the ways in which we're recording the buildings. Um, those of you who know the survey volumes will know there's a tradition of very uh, careful and attractive line drawings, something we are very insistent we want to maintain. Uh, this has been slightly cropped, never mind. I live in Rathbone Place, typical little Georgian house, and we carry on that tradition of, of drawing plans, details. But we're also trying to think of new ways of presenting information. I haven't thought of trying to see if it works. This is a piece of Veer Street, uh, church by, by Gibbs, one of the first things to be built in the Marlborough area we're studying at the same time as Cavendish Square was taking off in the early 18th century. Very nice photographs by English heritage photographer Chris Redgrave, who's working with us on the project. Um, but as well as having maybe a plan, section, elevation in the book, we have tried to come up with something slightly different. I'm not going to get to the work, am I? Because this is actually a, a, a video, which I'll maybe show you later on the laptop, which flies you around the interior um, of the building. It's done by English Heritage uh, draftsman. Andy Chris, no, it's not working, sorry, never mind. We'll come back to that later. Uh, we are thinking of new ways all the time of doing these things. I'll show you later on. Okay, um, sorry, I'm not moving again. Give me one second. Ah, oh, we are. Oxford Street. I did mention earlier that in order to help progress the project on Marlborough, we decided to devote a separate volume to a study of Oxford Street to be published later on. I mean, Oxford Street, part of it has already appeared in an earlier uh, Survey of London series, part of the south side. The problem is that Oxford Street is an extraordinarily long shopping street and it cuts across various parishes which the survey would cover independently. So we thought it was a good idea to do, do it as a whole. And one of the things we intend to do as part of this is to commission a photographic panorama of the entire street, both sides. Um, I can't show you an example of this for Oxford Street. Here's a similar sort of thing. This is uh, the Strand, I think, actually, which I, I just pulled off, off the web. Um, we think this would be uh, of great value, a sort of historic snapshot of London's most famous shopping street at a particular time in history. And we think it would greatly add to the appeal of the Oxford Street volume. The idea is to publish it as a separate photographic book alongside the survey volume. But of course it also offers much potential in terms of possible reuse uh, digitally. One of the things we thought we had, could possibly do is a kind of online web facility where you'd have the entire panorama that you could move along and it would give you historical information. I don't know if you know the building exploratories work on Whitechapel uh, High Street. It's called Panorama High Street East. I'm not going to attempt to show you it working, but the idea is that you can move along this panorama from one end of the street to the other. And as you go along, a little sign comes up at the top showing where you are um, geographically, and also you get information, historical information, which we could have, you know, edited excerpts from the survey's Oxford Street volume coming up um, when you highlight a particular building going along the panorama. Equally, we could add in historic views of the, the same sites as they were maybe 100 years ago, or maybe even Talus, if you know the Talus panoramas of, of streets of London, it'd be nice to have that maybe coming up as well. So the idea is that some kind of web facility would, would be done. And there's even possibilities of of apps and things like that. And also, this kind of thing could potentially le lend itself towards sponsorship. We are in touch with, there's an Oxford Street Traders Association we intend to get in touch with who might be interested in this because they, their shops will show up um, on the panorama. There's also a sort of West End companies group as well. So there's a lot of potential there, we think, um, for such a study. But it's a very different thing for us. But talking of Whitechapel, um, leads me back 
to those East End boys. Um, this is another possible new departure for the survey of London. Although some of us will plough on with southwestern Marylebone in the next few years, once we've finished the southeastern part, we're also preparing a proposal for external funding for quite a radical new approach um, to our urban and topographical recording uh, in the heart of the East End, in Whitechapel. <laughs> Sorry. Apparently Whitechapel, people will tell you, was very safe when the craze were around. And looking at that picture, I'm not surprised. <laughs> The idea is radical for the survey in terms of its research methodology and in the end product. Um, and neither of what I'm going to explain to you will be possible given our current staffing levels and funding. So the approach is going to be uh, an, a, a submission to the HRC for additional funding. And we've chosen Whitechapel for this project partly because it helps us maintain a sense of balance, as I mentioned to you earlier, while working on Marlborough polite, wealthy West End area, we can also work on the East End. But it's mostly because of the um, threat, the development pressures that are happening in Whitechapel right now because of its proximity to the City of London, which is continually expanding. Also, there's apparently to be a new crossrail station there too. And also because of its significant history in terms of commerce, of poverty, and particularly of immigration. Uh, German immigrants in the 18th century, European Jews in the 19th, uh, Bengalis from the 1960s, and now a, a very large Bangladeshi population in Whitechapel. In fact, Whitechapel Road has one of the largest of all of London's mosques uh, built in the 1980s, the East London Mosque, and also a more recent London Muslim Centre. And the impact of immigration on this scale on London and its consequences in terms of local character, local development, local architecture is a major topic and it's one that the survey hasn't really addressed before, uh, the influence of, of immigration on a large scale. The plan is to create uh, a web resource sorry. I'm stuck again, but never mind. There we go. Plans to create a digital web resource with the help of the local community involvement through wiki or crowdsourcing methods. This would be, I can't show you because we don't know what it's going to look like, but basically it would have a map GIS base on which would be overlaid information, drawings, photographs, film, maps and so on, hopefully in a clear an authoritative format because we want to maintain that sense of good design and authoritativeness that the, the survey is renowned for. And it would also include the survey's own findings, its own research data, its own draft text, its own photographs and drawings, as well as material uploaded by local residents and others and other historians. Editorial control would reside with the Survey of London to maintain that um, uh, the standards. And a book would follow a survey volume in the usual style, based upon the material gathered for the project. There would also be exhibitions, other local community events to, to try and, and broaden the impact. In a sense, uh, in terms of its method and its subject matter, it is a bit of a return to C.R. Ashby's commitment to social enlightenment and, and social equality through a shared understanding of our, our built environment. Which leads me on to this last item. Um, as I hope I've made you aware, the survey is always, I know it looks very traditional in terms of the big solid authoritative <laughs> academic volumes on London history, but we are always looking for new and exciting ways to get our information out to a broader public. Um, and this short film, which you will be watching in a minute on this laptop, was made by my colleague, Aileen, my colleague Aileen Reed. It's called The When Stanley Plays Itself. Um, and it grew out of Aileen's involvement separately with a project, a combined project, uh, Cambridge and Liverpool Universities, 
a film project exploring the dichotomy between what referred to as the soft city, the city that we imagine, the city of myth, uh, the city of literature, art, etc., and the hard or recorded city that you might find in things like data, historical documents, or even in books like the Survey of London. And Aileen decided to make this film about a particular post-war housing estate in Battersea, which we covered in our recent volumes, um, as a way of bringing together our brand of urban history with excerpts from feature films and documentaries, from archive sound and, and photographs, in a way that would enhance your understanding of the estate and perhaps the sense of place that you get from it. So we'll now attempt to watch this and then afterwards we can have a little discussion about some of the things I've touched upon. So just see what we can do here. Yeah. Oh, I'll just pull the plug out, I think. That's why it doesn't move around. It's just a question of where. estate is the second largest of Battersea's post-war public housing projects. Its long drawn out construction stretching between 1956 and 1972 meant that it was far from a single planned entity. But the portion built in 1963 to 1966 to designs by George True and Dunn has a coherence of design lacking in any other post-war housing built in Battersea. The physical character of the area north of Clapham Junction is conveyed in a memoir by James Guttridge, brought up during the 1920s in Benfield Street off York Road, which ran through what is now York Gardens, a short, slightly crescented street of about 60 houses, with some high stink poles, as sewer vents were known, as its only ornament. Each house contained at least two, but mostly three families, remembered Gutteridge. So there was a right assortment to create a lively neighbourhood. He supplies a minute description of how the houses were inhabited. For instance, that there were coal chutes in the pavement, but they were never really used, and front doors were generally unlocked or had a key on a string. Plans for the triangle between Winstanley, Grant and Plough Roads were finalised and built between 1963 and 1966. A site factory beside St Peter's Church, staffed by a 20-man crew, opened in July 1964 to begin efficient industrialised construction of the Winstanley estate. Here, and on the building site itself, a novel type of portal crane, Little David, was used for casting, striking out, lifting and placing, and in the initial stages, erection of the actual production line. During construction, the crane moved sequentially along the east-west circulation routes and in and out of each courtyard in turn. Floor slabs and external walls at ground level were of in-situ concrete, while most of the upper portions of the structure were cast in the factory. End walls were generally of brick. The bulk of the estate relied on the geometry of a series of four and five storey mezzanette blocks set at right angles to form regular courts facing in alternate directions, while a second floor circulation deck threaded through the blocks. Winstanley Road 
forming the triangle's eastern flank, had a thin tower, Spool Court, just two rooms deep, and now with 22 storeys at its north end, and three square squat towers of 11 storeys, Clark Lawrence, Shaw and Sendell Courts, set below it in diagonal echelon. Following the government's Parker Morris report of 1961, internal space standards were improved from original plans. And play areas received fresh attention. Once you're off the ground floor, where can they play? There's no one to see, no one to talk to except the birds and they're crapping all over the place. The low-rise blocks on the Winstanley estate, built in 1964, soon showed signs of trouble. Their lifts were exposed to rain at ground floor level and often failed. A vociferous Winstanley Estate Tenants Association was therefore vexed when in 1967 the estate won a Royal Institute of British Architects medal for good design. A facelift in 1982, finally remedied some of the faults the tenants complained of. Despite evident wealth and investment, areas of Battersea that had been poor in the 19th century have remained so, as in many areas of inner London. The influx of middle-class professionals from the late 1960s onwards was matched by the exodus of most of the area's skilled manual workforce. There remained largely the elderly, and those with special housing and social needs, the unemployed, single parent families, and large immigrant groups. A 2006 study showed that northern districts around Battersea Park Road were in a state of serious social deprivation. The worst problems centre on the swathes of public housing, the Patmore, Doddington, York Road and Winstanley Estates once beacons of hope after slum clearance and war damage. The 19th century social researcher Charles Booth might recognise in Battersea today the same more than usual mix of wealth and poverty, the respectable and the squalid, that he found here more than a hundred years ago. I was born in Battersea, I lived all my life in Battersea, so I don't want to go and get buried in Wandsworth, do I? Thanks. Right, that's it, thanks. That's it? That's it, right. yeah. Thank you very much, Tom. <laughs>